Okay, uh, so good evening students and a very warm welcome to Professor Indranil Shangupta. This is our special lecture series. The topic for today's discussion is the bond of Niels and Shefford model and the follow up from the Levy process lecture would be useful in this case. I think uh, Professor Shangupta will indicate that. Uh, Indranil, Thank you for making time for us. This is an MSTAT second year class. So these are all statistics postgraduate students, but they have the necessary background on stochastic process probability as well as calculus. And the basics of mathematical finance has been taught in the course already. So it should be fine. So over to Indronil. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Um... Professor Mukherjee for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, so uh, the topic is the Barn of Nielsen and Shepard model. Um, so I'll start uh, with some very basic background. Um, let's start with, uh, and I'm sure probably um, you have already seen this before, but uh, still I want to uh, include some of this uh, topic to start with. So the first one which I want to talk about is infinite infinite divisibility. You all can see it, right? It's visible, right? Can you all see the board? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so what I'll be assuming you know Levy process, so let's start with that. So let XT be a Levy process. And then um, for every T, this XT is infinitely divisible. Now, um, what I mean is, um, I'm sure you, you know the definition for the infinite divisibility. It means that for every T, I can write xt in terms of um, n linearly independent um, processes. Or so, let me write this. So for fixed t, and then xt can be written as a sum of some fi. So i goes from one to n, and I can take uh, so xt can be written as i from one to n fi, where fi's are independent distributions. And this is possible for every t and for every n. So that is called the infinite divisibility. Okay. Now, every Levy process is infinite divisible. So probably you have already seen that in the discussion for the Levy process. So that's one of the major properties for Levy process. But the property of my interest is the following. Then con if, uh, if is an infinite divisible distribution, then there exists a Levy process xt such that the distribution of x1 is equals to one f. Okay, so it will be uh, clear why I'm uh, talking about this result now, uh, because it will play a very crucial role in the entire theory of the barn of nielsen shepard model. So um, you'll see it has a lot of connection, it will have a lot of connection uh, to what I'm going to talk next. But just remember that if I give you, or if you give me any infinite divisible distribution, so it's right uh, here. Um, so if you give me an F, which is an infinite divisible distribution, then I can construct a Levy process XT so that x1 is distributionally equal to f. Okay. So that's the first result. Uh, uh, again, I'll not prove it, but um, it's, it's fairly easy to prove. Okay, now with this, uh, let's move on to the next one. <laughs> I'm just trying to scroll down. Please excuse me because I'm also new with this technology, so it may take some time. 
So here's a theorem. It's a distribution is infinitely divisible if and only if it is of the form phi t, which is equal to exponential of psi t, where the psi t is given by, um, don't worry too much about um, all this uh, notation and symbols. Um, I'll point out what I'm, what is the most crucial thing in this entire expression, but let me write the result anyway. New dx. Okay, so where this, I'll not write this, where this gamma is a real number, this sigma squared is also a positive, and then new, which is the most crucial thing here, is the Levy density. Um, it's, it's a Levy measure. Okay, so this is a Levy measure. Okay, so let's go back and let's pause uh, for a little moment and then um, explain this. So suppose there is a distribution which is infinite divisible. Okay, so then uh, it says that every infinite divisible distribution can be represented in the form of phi t for some t. Okay, so it, t, t can be one to whatever number. Uh, so phi t equals to exponential of psi t where this psi t is given by this. So what does it mean? It means give me any infinite divisible distribution. Suppose you give me f, okay? So you give me a, a, an infinite divisible distribution, namely f. Then what I can do is I can write this equals to say x1, and then that will be given by some distributions like this one, or that will be given by exponential of psi t, where psi t is given by this one. What? How does it help us? So this really helps us because, uh, it is giving us a way to construct the Levy measure out of infinite divisible distribution. So if give me any infinite divisible distribution, I can construct a Levy measure out of it. In other words, I can get a Levy process out of it. Okay, So that means if you specify a, uh, an infinite divisible distribution, I can construct a Levy process out of that infinite divisible distribution so that X1 matches with that F. Okay, Does that make sense? So what I'm saying is one more time. So if you give me X or F, so F is infinite divisible distribution. Again, all this thing will play a primal role in the later uh, theory. So F is infinite divisible. And then I can construct a Levy process so that X1 is distributionally equal to F. So that's all the previous theorem is telling me. So that's all this is telling me, okay? Good. So now with this, uh, by the way, please interrupt me if you have any question at any point of time. Um, you don't have to wait till the end. Let's now put some examples. So example. To see its connection um, to the actual finance problems. Um, as you know that um, uh, well, there are various versions. I'll, I'll uh, typically follow one version. It's uh, called the gamma distribution. The density of gamma distribution with parameters a and b both are bigger bigger than equal to bigger than zero is given by Uh, fx equals to b to the a over gamma a. Again, uh, there are various reparameterization re of this thing. So um, don't worry if you have seen a different uh, distributional formula, those all are equivalent. I'm just picking up a particular version. So this is a version of the gamma distribution Okay, for some a and uh, b, which is uh, positive. Okay. It can be shown that, so can be shown that it is 
infinitely divisible. I'll leave it up to you um, to show that it's infinitely divisible. Again, it's not really very hard. Um, it's, it's actually very easy to show it's infinitely divisible distribution. Um, so then, uh, so how does it help us? Uh, again, we are not talking about just the infinite divisible distribution. Our goal is to construct a Levy process out of this infinite divisible distribution. So uh, as we know that from the previous theory, uh, corresponding to every infinite divisible distribution, I can construct a Levy process so that X1 is equal to distribution equal to gamma, AB. Okay, so there exists a Levy process So that, so that x1 is distributionally equal to gamma. Why? From the previous theorem. So I'm, I'm referring to this theorem at the end. So this one. Since, um, since gamma is infinite divisible, therefore there exists a Levy process x, uh, so that, uh, that x t uh, at time one uh, is distributionally equal to this gamma process. Okay. And let me just write the, uh, uh, I'm sure that um, you know that uh, Levy process is uh, characterized by three things. One is its drift, one is its uh, volatility, and third one is its Levy density. So if we can uh, show that in this case, XT, the corresponding Levy process has triplet uh, triplet is given by the first one is given by a one minus a to the minus b over b so that's a drip term there is no volatility and then the district the levy density is given by um sorry it's a e to the minus b x x to the minus one for the positive case b x so um, I'm sure you have seen um, the connection. Uh, uh, well, the, there is a connection between the Levy density and Levy distribution. Um, so, um, or sorry, Levy measure and Levy de density. So this whole thing is the Levy measure. And in this case, there exists a density and density is given by the first part of it. Okay. Again, don't worry too much if you couldn't uh, remember all those things. Just know that, so the summary of this entire thing is if since this gamma distribution is infinitely divisible distribution, there exists a Levy process uh, so that X1 is equal to gamma AB and that Levy process XT, what is XT? So that X1 is the distribution equal to gamma AB process. So that distribution X uh, or that Levy process XT, uh, it has characteristic triplet or Levy triplet given by this three. This is the drift, this is the volatility and this is the Levy density. Okay, so that is the uh, first observation. Okay. Question so far? Okay. Now next, uh, I can do the same, another example uh, before I move on to the actual topic. And all this will play actually central role. Uh, inverse Gaussian. Okay. An inverse Gaussian distribution is given by Fx equals to A over square root of two pi e to the a b x to the minus three over two e to the minus one half s squared x to the minus one plus b squared x and for x is bigger than zero and for two constants a and b positive it can be shown that this is also infinitely divisible and hence there exists a Levy process such that Levy process XT such that XT or X1 is distributionally equal to inverse Gaussian AB. Again, I'm sure that you must have found um, a, a different uh, characterization of this inverse Gaussian distribution. There are many. Uh, sometimes we use this one, sometimes some version of it, but all those are equivalent in the sense that uh, one can be transformed to the other. So if you have seen other, that's perfectly fine. Uh, but this is one characterization of the inverse Gaussian distribution with some AB. So what I'm saying is, uh, if um, since this inverse Gaussian distribution is infinitely divisible, there exists a Levy process such that 
x1 is equal to that inverse Gaussian distribution, okay? And as before, as I have done before, uh, here also the, the Levy process, again, which Levy process? The Levy process that corresponds to x1, equal is, which is distributionally equal to inverse Gaussian. So that Levy process um, has triplet given by uh, a over b two phi b minus one. So this is the CDF of the um, standard normal distribution and zero. And then um, uh, I'll not write the last one. It's very uh, messy and complicated, but just know that uh, it's uh, Levy density times dx. It has a density times dx. Okay, so just like the previous one, so uh, it will it will have some expression in the form of uh, the previous. Um, uh, so let me just see if I can go up here. You see that you, it has a density times the dx, so it'll have a almost a similar form for the inverse Gaussian case. Uh, I'll not write it because it's uh, it'll may take long. Okay, let me write it uh, since I wrote everything. It's not that bad as well. So it's a over square root of two pi x cubed e to the power minus one half b squared x one x bigger than zero dx. So that you have a complete record of this thing. Yeah, so this is this is something like that. All right, so the takeaway, the main takeaway from uh, for all this thing is if I give you a in, I give you a div, uh, infinite divisible, divisible distribution, then you can always construct a Levy process out of that. Okay. Now with this, uh, let's turn our attention uh, to the actual topic of today's discussion, which is the uh, which is the BNS model. So let's do that. So this model is um, uh, this very famous model in finance. It's called the Barndorf, Nielsen, and Shepard model, um, named after uh, two mathematicians, Barndorf, Nielsen, and Shepard. Um, so its model is given by this. ST is given by S0 e to the XT, where ST is typically uh, stock or, uh, yeah, it's mostly stock. Um, it's, it's mostly used in the, in the derivative market. What is this xt? This xt is given by a stochastic differential equation, mu plus beta sigma squared p dt plus sigma t dwt plus rho dz lambda t. Okay, so this is the dynamic, I'll, I'll explain all the terms, but let me just complete writing the whole thing. And then uh, this sigma t squared, you see that there is a sigma t squared and sigma t appears in two cases and they are given by d of sigma t squared equals to minus lambda sigma t squared dt plus d of z lambda t. Okay. Now let me try to explain these terms. For example, what is this mu? So mu is just a constant for now. Beta is also a constant, positive. And then we have a rho that's also constant, but uh, this is a little different. So this is a negative constant. So what I'm saying is this is positive, this is positive typically, and but nu is negative. Well, this is actually more than equal to zero. But nu is strictly uh, less than zero. That's the um, usual assumption. I'll explain why, okay? Uh, and also this lambda is, um, constant, uh, it's, uh, well, it's a constant, but it's more than a constant. We'll see uh, its meaning later on. But so, uh, so far it can be any any real number, okay? So that's the model. Now, let me just explain two, two very interesting thing out of this one. Uh, so this is, um, so ST is typically a stock price. For example, you can think this, um, as a S&P 500 price. Are you familiar with S&P 500? Um, no, sir. 
Uh, okay, so this is just, uh, so, so far, uh, well, if you're not familiar, that's perfectly fine. Just take this as a, as a, as some stock value, okay? So uh, I just mentioned this because so then um, I was about to say that sigma t squared uh, is a VIX price or VIX uh, index. Again, do, please don't worry if you don't know this, just know that uh, from strictly mathematical point of view, ST is just a stock price, which is a, a price like this, something like that. Volatility. Model. What does it mean? It means that the volatility here, which is sigma t squared is stochastic. It's given by this one. I'll explain other terms. I, I forgot to explain a lot of other things, but uh, let me just mention this. Uh, why I say that? Because uh, you have seen a lot of, you probably have seen a lot of stochastic volatility model. For example, a very famous one is the Heston model. People use this all the time. Uh, another famous model is um, Allen White model. Um, another one is um, same. Um, Yeah, yeah, model. And there are many more. Okay, I'm just listing three. Okay, so the, all those are stochastic volatility model. And uh, this is also uh, a stochastic volatility model. Again, if you are not familiar with these terms, don't worry. All it means that the volatility is given by a stochastic process. Now, let's come to the main point. What is WT here? So WT here is a Brownian motion. So that's a continuous stochastic process. What is this ZT or Z lambda T? Uh, well, ZT. So that is actually a Levy. It's a Levy process, but it's a little more than that. It's called a Levy subordinator. I'll explain what it means. What is a Levy subordinator? If you recall that a Levy process is characterized by three things. So if you recall that Levy process is characterized by three things. One is gamma, that's the drift part. One is sigma, that's the volatility part. And then the third one is nu, that is the Levy density, the Levy density part. What is a subordinator? Levy subordinator is a very special sort of unique Levy process for which this gamma is um, zero or at least positive, sorry. It's a uh, usually positive. Sigma is zero and this nu, the density is positive. So that means it can only have positive jumps. It has no negative jump. So a Levy subordinator would look like this, the increasing process. It's always increasing. Uh, my drawing is bad, but it should be uh, something like it go going for some time and then uh, having a jump and going for some time and having a jump and so on. Okay. Uh, in fact, this picture is the, um, uh, really a misrepresentation of what I just said. It doesn't have any Gaussian, uh, it doesn't have any Brownian motion part, so it cannot have this wiggly line. It is just a straight line and then going up. So let me just try to draw a bit of the picture. So it is something like this. So it's going some time and then going up, and then going some time, going up, some time, going up, and so on. So this is the, the picture of the Levy subordinate. Okay. So, so then let, let's go back to the model one more time since uh, the main topic Could you is, just uh, explain what sigma equal to zero means? So um, sigma equal to zero means it doesn't have any brown in motion part. So okay. let me see. Uh, okay. uh, I, can, I can find my cursor, yeah. Yeah, so sigma equals to zero. Um, uh, uh, well, please don't confuse that sigma with this sigma. So this is the sigma for the model. By sigma, I mean that, um, as I said, that, uh, Every Levy process, if you recall the Levy, the Levy characterization, so XT, every Levy process is given by some gamma times T plus sigma times WT plus there is a jump part that has two integrals. First integral is for less than one and that has a martingle, uh, that has a non martingle part and then X bigger than one, which has a martingle part or maybe the other way around. Sorry, this one is a martingle and this one is not martingle. Uh, anyway. So this is the gamma of the Levy process, and this is the sigma of the Levy process. And then uh, this jump part has some mu associated with it. Those are the Levy densities. So when I say sigma equals to zero, I mean for, for this particular Levy process, which I call to be the subordinator, uh, there is no brown motion part. Yes, Does it yes. answer your question? Okay, so now uh, let's see. Uh, 
why I care about this model. So this is uh, just a model, right? So this is one of those, uh, I, can, I can write any model I like. So why do people care about this model? There are several reasons. In fact, there are a lot of advantages of this model. Uh, I'll just provide you two. One is very easy to see from this one and other one I'll derive and then I'll move on. Let's see. Um, a typical market scenario uh, is something like this one. So if I draw a stock price, so this is suppose, and this is from the data, from market data. If you, I should have, um, I should, well, I have that file, but I don't know how to put it here, but le let me just uh, draw this by hand. So a typical market data shows that if you have ST something like this one, so ST is a stock price, remember? The stock price uh, is going, going up and then going down or going up, going down. Now, as I said that uh, we can really see this in the market in terms of uh, its proxy sigma t square because sometimes S and ST is given by say S and P 500, as I said, again, don't worry if you don't know it, but sigma t square, so we can see both in the market. Now, what, we, what people have seen is the following, corresponding to this picture, sigma t would look like this, something like this. Now you see the thing is, please observe that whenever there is a downward market movement, there is a corresponding upward sigma t squared movement. Same here. Okay. So whenever there is a downward market movement or downward movement for ST, there is a corresponding upward sigma t squared movement. Okay, so this effect is known to be as the leverage effect. L-E-V-E-R-A-G-E. -E. It's R. Okay. So leverage effect is this effect. Now let's go to the model. You see that I said that rho is strictly positive, strictly negative, and the z is a subordinator, meaning it can only go up. Okay. Now the movement of this st, since it's exponential of something, so it is pretty much determined by this xt. So if xt goes up, st would go up. If xt goes down, st would go down. Okay. So therefore. You see, forget about the first part, but uh, suppose you have an upward jump in the market. So that means Z is positive, uh, there is a sudden spike for Z. So since rho is negative, that means that would correspond to a sudden market downfall, okay? So that means it is corresponding to some, some regions, like some portions like this or this, right? Now, as I said that we are using the same Z here and here. And note that it's, con it's a coefficient is just one. So that means if, uh, if there is a downfall in the market, there will be a corresponding upward movement in the sigma t, sigma t square uh, uh, value because uh, this represents a jump. It, it, this represents a positive jump. And this, since rho is negative, this represents a negative jump. So a negative jump in xt would represent a corresponding po positive jump in sigma t squared. And that is exactly what I drew in this picture. So that means, Barn of Nielsen and Shepard model has an inbuilt leverage effect in it. Uh, there are other models um, which struggle to include leverage effect in the model. For example, it's not at all obvious uh, why leverage effect should be there for the Heston model, for example, which is very popular, but it's not ob obvious at all. Okay. But here it's sort of inbuilt. Advantage number one. Advantage number two, which is more mathematical. <laughs> so let's. Uh, go down a little bit. So why, uh, yes. uh, why are you considering the data as if uh, it, it only has jumps downwards and not upwards? So that's, a, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, so uh, the obvious question is why I considered uh, some model which has only downward jump and uh, no upward jump. Well, first of all, it may have some upward movement because uh, ideally this sigma, uh, this WT with coefficient sigma, it can go up. Also, it has a drift term that can move it up. So it doesn't mean that the data will have only a downward movement, but you're right. Um, this, this model actually gives only downward jumps, though it may, may have upward movement, but the, the, but the jumps are all, always downward. Now, 
two answers. First of all, this is no way the ideal model of the financial market. It's just an approximation like any other, other model. I mean, no model is perfect. So this is one of the biggest drawbacks of this model. It only considers the down, downward movement. However, there is a point. Why we consider the downward movement? Because people only care about the downward movement in the stock market. Uh, if it really goes up, which is uh, unlikely, but if, I mean, if it goes up maybe 1,000 points, uh, well, uh, if, you, if you study the papers, uh, well, if you, if you look at the research papers, they really are concerned with the market crash. Or, or, so those are effectively the market downward movement. I mean, nobody really cares what if, uh, what, cares to predict what if the market goes 1,000 power point up. Well, there is a certain advantage of that model too, or there is a certain purpose of that model too, but re that is really um, not in the focus of our research problem, or that is not really considered in research that much. I mean, for, for some reason or other. So uh, people really care about the downward movement of the, of the stock price because it has really a critical implication in terms of market crash. And hence, this model, which really uh, gives a, a model to, uh, to predict or to model the downward movement of a stock market um, is useful. Saying that, I, and I agree uh, to you that uh, by no, it's not ideal. Uh, but please remember that it doesn't really mean that the mo model will predict that the market will always have a downward movement. Uh, it may have an upward movement because it has a serious drift term, serious volatile term. So it may go up, but its jump is only downward. Okay, does that answer your question? Uh, but then the additional emphasis it gives on negative on the on the down, jumps down does not does that not make it more? Um, I mean. Uh, uh, overestimate the amount of uh, down downward falls it would have it does to cer certain extent yes to certain extent but again no model is perfect so this model emphasizes uh, downward movement so what it does is it sort of ignores the upward jumps but um, uh, that has some, some drawbacks again this is not perfect uh, but that has some drawbacks but that is actually better than having only upward movement or uh, having uh, well you may, you may very easily argue that why not use a Z, a Z which can be easily like upward or downward jump? Why do you just restrict to a, a subordinator? Why don't you just consider a Levy process? There are some reason to it. We'll come to that later. Uh, because uh, if you include all the processes here, you'll, lo you'll lose a lot of mathematical structure in it. And that, uh, that actually defeat our purpose of using this model. And that's why we use this model. Okay, so now with this, uh, let's consider the last equation. So this D of sigma t squared. Uh, so if I, if I solve this equation, so let's write this equation. D of sigma t squared equals to minus lambda sigma t squared plus, uh, sorry, dt plus D of z lambda t. Uh, let, let's just write uh, with t. Let's assume lambda equals to one without loss of generality. Now uh, I can solve this equation very easily. I can write this as d of sigma t squared plus lambda sigma t squared uh, dt equals to d of zt. Multiply both sides by the integration factor in this case, which is e to the lambda t. And that will lead me to that will lead me to d of a to the lambda t sigma square t equals to a to the lambda t d of z t. And hence, if I solve this, I'll get sigma t squared equals to a to the minus lambda t sigma squared zero plus zero to t a to the minus lambda t minus s d z s, okay? So this is the expression for sigma t squared. If I solve the equation, I get something like this one. Uh, what is the solution? Uh, so I'm solving the last equation here. So if you solve the last equation here, you'll get a solution of this form. So sigma t squared is e to the minus lambda t, sigma z squared plus this integral, okay? Here comes the second advantage of the model that I promised. Um, if you look at the literature for the stochastic volatility model, uh, this is an equation in terms of sigma t squared. So it's a D of sigma t squared equals to something, okay? So, um, and if you know the Heston model or many other models, those are also a stochastic volatility equations for sigma t squared. 
now you can write any equation you like but it has to make some sense in the in other words when you solve this equation whatever you get as sigma t squared that got to be positive because it's sigma t squared okay and sigma is a real number so since sigma t square is positive, the solution should better be positive. Now, surprisingly enough, for Heston model or for many other model, Hull and White model, it's not obvious. So there, the solution sigma t squared, when you solve those stochastic volatility models, those solutions sigma t squared are not always positive. Sigma t squared is positive only under certain conditions, and those conditions are very famous conditions known to be as the former conditions. Uh, so some very, uh, very particular values of the parameters, so those sigma t squared are positive. However, for the barn of Nielsen Shepard model, look at the uh, look at the expression. This is positive because it's exponential. Z is taken to be the subordinator, and hence this got to be positive too. Therefore, sigma t squared is lower is bounded below by e to the minus lambda t sigma zero squared. In other words, it's positive. That's one of the reasons, or this is one of the very uh, well small reasons why we take Z to be a subordinator. Uh, Again, to answer the previous um, question, why Z is taken to be uh, only negative jumps uh, or only positive jumps? Because uh, here, unless you have positive jumps, sigma t square may, may be negative, and that defeats our purpose of this model. Okay, so this is one of the reasons. Again, the uh, main reason will come later. Uh, so this is one of the reasons. Uh, but so the a summary of uh, a couple of advantages is uh, leverage effect is included in model. So summary in, uh, for, of, uh, of the advantage of the BNS model. And the second one is sigma t squared is bigger than zero. Uh, it comes sort of as free. We don't have to do any, any uh, former condition or anything like that. Okay, uh, now with this, uh, let's uh, proceed. Any questions so far? So once again, this is my model and uh, we I sort of clarified some of the advantages of this model. Now, I guess I'm just a little going a little slow. So let me just uh, um, skip one topic and let me now go to the next uh, topic. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Okay, so now, I'll be showing some advantages of this model, more advantages of this model, and that uh, the the second uh, this this advantages will include uh, more technical discussions of why I need a subordinator in the model to first place. Also, you may argue why I need this lambda. Why don't I just write? Why, why don't I just take um, lambda to be equals to one? Or uh, why don't don't I just uh, use the same scale or something like that? Um, we'll see that this lambda is a sort of crucial parameter and uh, that'll actually give us more flexibility. So this uh, will lead to the second part of my discussion. So whatever I discussed in the previous case is just the model and then the second part. And this starts with uh, the self decomposability. Distribution. There are two versions of this uh, cell decomposable distribution, and I'll not write those uh, for the interest of time. Briefly speaking, I'm sure all of most of you know this. Um, uh, so, if X is self decomposable, then X is distribution equal to some C X plus X um, independent. So, what does it mean? So, for um, so for every C, as long as C belongs to zero to one, and X I is independent of X. Okay, so if x is distributionally equal to cx plus xi, where xi is independent, xi and x are independent, linearly independent. Um, oh, sorry, the x and xi are independent, and then c is a constant between zero and zero and one. So for every constant z between zero and one, if this is true, then x is known to be as a self-decomposable distribution. Okay, it can be shown that self-decomposable distribution is a subset of infinite divisible distribution. Okay. So the, dis the class of self decomposable distribution is a subset of the class of infinite divisible distributions. Okay. Now, uh, one of the main theorems uh, which I want to write uh, 
and this will be really crucial. Uh, this will be probably the most important theorem uh, for today's lecture. And follow this carefully. Uh, if X is self decomposable, then there exists a stationary stochastic process sigma t squared and a Levy process ZT independent of sigma zero squared such that sigma t squared is distributionally equal to x for all t and and sigma t squared is equal to e to the minus lambda t sigma zero squared plus zero to t e to the minus lambda t minus s d of z lambda s for all lambda bigger than zero. Um, its converse is also true, um, and that's the second part of the theorem. Converse is also true. What does it mean? It means that if sigma t squared is a stationary process where zt is a Levy process independent of sigma zero squared, um, so such that this holds, this relation holds, then sigma t squared is in fact self decomposable. But I'll not write this here because that's not of real interest of what I'm going to talk, talk about next. This part is um, of our interest. So let me just uh, go through this slowly. Suppose I give you, suppose I give you a self decomposable distribution. Okay, so xt is self decomposable and we'll see that the distributions that we have studied so far as infinite divisible, those are also self decomposable. Namely gamma is self decomposable, inverse Gaussian is self decomposable. Okay, so we know a lot of self decomposable distributions. Okay then there exists a stationary stochastic process sigma t squared, okay? So that means that every time its distribution is the same and a Levy process ZT independent of sigma zero squared such that sigma t squared is distributionally equal to X. Why it's true for every T because it's stationary. And that's why for every T it's distri distribution got to be X where X is this self decomposable distribution. Not only that, this sigma t squared is given by this nice expression. Now, if I go back, and again, I wrote this for the, um, for lambda equals to one, when I saw this, uh, let's see. Oh, I think it's here. Yeah. So in the previous slide, when I saw this equation, Look at this equation, uh, and here I solve the equation for uh, for uh, um, the stochastic process, where this is the equation, and I got an expression for sigma t squared. Uh, please note that um, uh, sort of I, I did something wrong here. I didn't include lambda here. Um, um, so if if you did include lambda here, you'd exactly end up with whatever I have here. Um, in other words, please, uh, I don't know why I did that, but let me just. So what I'm trying to say is, if you solve this entire equation, then if you solve for sigma t squared, you will see that sigma t squared, uh, if I wrote it correctly, namely, uh, if I wrote sigma lambda here, uh, then you would have gotten uh, this equation for sigma t squared. 
In other words, this is the solution of the BNS equation stochastic ball 50. So sigma t squared equals to this one really gives you the solution for the stochastic ball. In other words, this really gives me a relation between the stationary stochastic process sigma t squared and the stochastic volatility as defined by the BNS model. It gives me a way to model the sigma t squared in the BNS model. So if I can choose a stochastic, if I, if I can choose a stationary or suppose you give me a self decomposable distribution and suppose I can model sigma t squared according to that, uh, to that x, x is a self decomposable distribution. Then I automatically know this z, uh, I'll show you a way to do it. But then I, then I know that sigma t squared is written in this way and, and I can find this uh, distribution of z. And once I find the distribution of z, I know the entire model, okay? In other words, from a self-decomposable distribution, I can construct this entire three equations. So this entire three equations can be constructed out of just a self-decomposable distribution x. So all you need to know is to uh, find um, is to find a self decomposable distribution that is actually representing the stationary process sigma t squared and you're done. You have the entire model. Let me show you an example how to do it. Okay, so that will be really interesting uh, to see how to construct this BNS model. And I'll conclude with that. Uh, but before that, let me write a nice theorem, which will sort of also give a very interesting relation between uh, two things. One is sigma t squared and other one is zt. Now, please note that if I know the stationary distribution of sigma t squared, I know somehow the distribution for sigma t squared. How do I compute the distribution for zt? Here is a theorem. And let me write this in red just to distinguish between these two. It I get a question. Yes. Sir, uh, in this theorem, uh, zt is a Levy process, mm -hmm. but we need a Levy subordinator. For... Uh, not, not, not for this theorem. So in order to construct those three things. In order to construct those three From things for a single X. This is for the Levy, Levy process, in general for Levy process. However, uh, well, um, I don't know if I have, will have time to cover other theorems. Uh, that will need Levy subordinator. But for this particular theorem, you don't need any, any subordinate. It's true for Levy process. However, you may argue that in order to make sense out of, out of this equation, uh, sigma t, uh, well, this z got to be a subordinator because otherwise sigma t square may not be positive. But again, for this particular theorem, there is no requirement of subordinator. In other words, it may have some Gaussian part. No, I, I think he's saying that when you're beginning with an x and then uh, saying that- What is the guarantee that your z is? Right, I mean, if you start with an x, which is decomposable, yes. then- to uh, arrive at those uh, but, three things, so how do you guarantee that the state you obtain is indeed a Levy subordinate? Oh, that, what is the guarantee that it's a Levy, uh, Levy process? No, no, it's a Levy subordinate. The Levy process is uh, a result of this theorem. There is no guarantee. So that's what I'm saying, that this theorem does not, uh, does not guarantee that it's a subordinate. In order to, uh, well, it, it only shows that it's some Levy process. I, I understand the purpose of your question. So probably you're relating to this too. So in the definition I wrote here, Z is a subordinator. And in this theorem, I'm writing that Z is a Levy process. So your question is why, uh, uh, what's the guarantee that it's a subordinator, right? My, yes, my yes. answer is there is no guarantee. This theorem is not guaranteeing that this is subordinator. That Z is subordinator will be coming from another theorem. Oh, okay. That will, that I'll probably not write today. All this theorem is saying that this is a Levy process. That's it. Now I had a question that uh, when you are beginning with an X and then you are saying that there exists some Z and Sigma such that such, such that these things hold. Uh, how do you characterize the triplet of that Z? I mean, um, I it's just a Levy process. So it's a, it will have just. So we do not know its parameters. What what the parameters of that are given that given we know X. We don't know that, uh, but uh, I'll write a theorem which will show you a way to construct this new. So that I'm going to write next. So this theorem does not tell us the parameters. No, it, it only states what it states here. It only st states that it will be represented by a theorem like this, a uh, formula like this one. That's it. Okay. The the takeaway from this theorem is um, uh, I'm I'm sure. So I guess um, the idea of all this question is you're trying to see what's the relation between. 
uh, this theorem and the actual model? Um, my answer is uh, don't overthink. So this theorem is telling you actually what is stated here. So it only states that sigma t square is given by this relation, and that has sort of an uh, symmetry with uh, this equation in the sense that this equation, if solved, looks like this one. That is the only relation between these two so far. Okay, no, no more than that. Okay, let me write another theorem, uh, and that may be a little more interesting. Um, Suppose, uh, let me just, uh, for the interest of time, let me just concise this. Suppose uh, sigma t squared and z of lambda t are given by uh, this equation. So let's write one. Okay. Uh, If ux is the Levy density of, uh, let's see, of sigma t squared, uh, I'll, I'll explain this later on, uh, and uh, vx. Or sorry, Wx is the Levy density of Z1. Uh, uh, this two statement as it stands, it may not have any meaning. Uh, I'll explain what it means. Uh, because sigma t squared, it's, it's not even a Levy process. So what do I mean by that? I'll explain that. But then uh, these two are related by Wx equals to minus Ux minus x u prime x. Now, this is uh, this needs some justification, but this is a very nice theorem in my opinion. Okay, so what it is it's telling me? It's telling me the following. So suppose uh, sigma t squared and z of lambda t are related by this equation. Okay. Now, I'm assuming that, um, well, we know that sigma t squared is given by a self-decomposable process. And every self-decomposable process is given by um, infinite divisible process because self decomposable pr process is a subclass of this infinite divisible, right? So sigma t squared is given by an infinite divisible distribution. Remember at the very beginning of today's class, uh, so I think I wrote it here. So if f is infinite divisible, then there exists a Levy process so that x1 equals to f. I am talking about that Levy process. So when I say that Levy density of sigma t squared, I'm referring to that Levy process. So sigma t squared is infinite, it's actually stationary and any stationary process is not a Levy process. So you can prove that it's very easy. So every stationary process is not, not a Levy process. However, what I mean by this sentence is the following, that sigma t squared is infinite divisible and therefore corresponding to that, there exists a Levy process and I'm talking about the Levy density of that process. So if that is ux and wx is the Levy density of w1, uh, z1, again, z1 is a, uh, is a, restriction of ZT at time one. So I'm talking about the Levy density of that process. Okay, then these two are related by this equation. Okay, this is fascinating in the sense that uh, now let's, let's uh, forget about uh, whatever we have done, just focus on this part. Suppose somebody gave you, suppose somebody gave you a sub decomposable process, say inverse Gaussian, okay? Then you, you can model sigma t squared in terms of that. Right? So sigma t squared is following a stationary distribution of inverse Gaussian t, right? Then you know that sigma t squared is given by this relation. Z may be a Levy process, okay? How do you know that Levy process? You know a relation like this. So from where, so if W is the Levy density of, of Z1, you can, uh, so, so the Levy density of the, the Z1, you can construct from the Levy densities of the inverse Gaussian process. And hence, you know the Levy density of this Z, and hence you know everything about this Z. And now you go back and you know this Z, you know this entire process, so you can, uh, well, modulo this, uh, this uh, parameters, but you actually have a entire idea of how to compute this inter, uh, inter model. So you have, you know the uh, Z and you know this W, so you know the main pillars of the stochastic process for this, um, for this entire model. 
and hence you construct this. Let me show you a quick example of how to do it. As I said, uh, let's uh, take a inverse Gaussian. So in this case, uh, ux is one over square root of two pi delta x to the minus three over two e to the minus sigma squared x over two. I'm sure I'm using a different parameterization, but that's all right. Okay, so step one. I'll, I'll just show you step by step how to construct this. So we know that inverse Gaussian is a self-decomposable process. So Ig is self-decomposable. It's not obvious. It's not easy at all. Uh, there, in fact, there is a research paper which showed that this is self-decomposable. Um, you may try. It's it's a hard problem, but it's it's doable. So that implies Ig is infinite divisible because every self-decomposable process is infinite divisible. Step two. What I do is I assume that sigma t squared is modeled by a b or uh, sorry, in this case, inverse Gaussian of delta ga, uh, gamma. Okay, I model that. Uh, how do you choose this uh, delta and gamma? It's from the from the model. So for example, if you, uh, if you just uh, calibrate the sigma t squared using this inverse Gaussian model, then you may find this gamma and sigma from there. Okay, so once you have this model, then step three, how do you know the associated Z process? So I have this nice formula. So I know this U. So U is this uh, formula. So I can just uh, compute this WX from there. So WX, if you do that, you'll end up with two square root of two pi X to the minus three over two, one plus gamma squared X e to the minus one half gamma squared X. Further, inverse Gaussian is defined for only x is bigger than zero. Hence, this is also bigger than x is bigger than zero. So you found a subordinator because this wx is defined only for x is bigger than zero. So now I know the distribution of the z. What is the distribution of z? It's simply given by, uh, well, it has a density given by this formula. It's a very concrete formula. You can compute things with that. And since I know this Z, I know this process, and uh, my XT is given by this, sigma T square is given by this one, so I know this process, I have more handle on this process. There are many further things which you can do with this, but uh, that will be uh, a different lecture, but at least you know how to construct this process out of this theory. Okay. Uh, I think it's uh, past one hour, so uh, questions. Sir, why inverse Gaussian? Yeah, you good. Enlighten on this thing. Like, why are we worried about inverse Gaussian distribution? Because, because it's one of the self decomposer processes. That's another good question. So, you may ask why we even care about inverse Gaussian. I mean, uh, there, there are, uh, in, uh, so see that the main thing is self decomposable. Three most famous self decomposable distributions uh, that are worked on in practice are inverse Gaussian, gamma, and so both of these has two parameters. Uh, there is one three parameter distribution that's known to be as positive tempered stable, three parameters. So these three distributions uh, and many more. Um, well, actually in my paper, I worked with these three distributions because the, these three are, uh, this three has uh, some connection with the uh, barnock nielsen shepherd model because they are self-decomposable. And then historically in the empirical data, uh, in, in the empirical data, uh, they have seen that sigma t squared has some match with this uh, stationary inverse Gaussian distributions. That's that's one of the reasons why we, we care about that. Are there any other questions? In particular, in Ranil, you might uh, give them a few references. Um, I can send you the list of references, then uh, maybe you can forward oh, it. Sure. 
I'll do that. Uh, I don't know, like uh, in the, uh, in one hour, I cannot cover much, uh, but uh, there are a lot of more things to say. Uh, so, yeah, maybe a following lecture would be helpful. But uh, again, I didn't have much time. No, I understand, but if you could send us these pages, that would also be helpful. Sure, uh, sure. You I... can also send us these handwritten pages. Um, see, the whole lecture is being recorded, so the pages you will get from the recording anyway. Oh, that's great. Yes. But uh, if these pages are saved, I don't know. Are these saved? Yeah, I, I think I can save it. Uh, so uh, if these are saved, then maybe you can just send it yeah. as, a, as a PDF or something. Then that would yeah. be easy. All right. So if there are no other questions, then I would like to thank Indranil once again for making time for this class and uh, he will forward some references to me, which I will share with the students. And in fact, this is the last class of this semester in my course. Okay, good luck with your semester. So, so we are finishing on a high note. Uh, there are no other classes in this term, unless you have things to discuss, then let me know. I have one last question. Okay. Uh, that distribution inverse uh, Gaussian. That is a heavily right skewed distribution, right? That is true. Yes. So uh, by adjusting the parameters of a gamma distribution, so we can like uh, reach uh, to certain proximity of an inverse Gaussian distribution. I mean, I don't know whether we can do that. Uh, so, but uh, can, can like we, you, you mentioned uh, that to prove that this distribution is self decomposable is not a very easy thing to do. It requires. Uh, um, Yes. Uh, in, in fact, actually, uh, in, a, in a paper, it was proved. Yeah, that you mentioned. But uh, to prove for gamma distribution, is it also very difficult? Uh, that I don't know. But, but gamma distribution, uh, it's a well-known fact. Um, I think... Yes, uh, that, then we can work on with gamma distributions in simpler cases. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Like for ease of calculation, we can also work with gamma distribution, right? We can do the exact same thing with gamma distribution. Exact same thing. Uh, in fact, uh, I have that in my note. Uh, if I had time, I would have gone through that. Uh, so you can do the same thing for gamma distribution. You can do the same thing for positive impersonable distribution. And actually, I'll send you one of my papers um, to Digandada, and then he can forward it to you. That has all those calculations. Okay. Okay, all right then. Uh, good night to the students and a good day to Indranil. So, okay, bye-bye. I will just stop this recording now.